Right, so we are looking at uh, graphical models. We looked at both directed and undirected models, right? And I uh, said uh, the thing of uh, interest to us. So there are two things that are of interest. The so first thing is, uh, given a model, right? How do you do inference using the model? Right. So what is the inference question? Question inference question is trying to answer queries on marginals, right? So I give you a very complex uh, uh, joint probability distribution. I want to know what is the probability that there is an earthquake. Yeah, that's not a very complex uh, system, but anyway. So what is the probability that there is an earthquake? Right. I can also ask for conditional marginals. Given that John called, what is the probability there is an earthquake? So these are things we looked at, right? So it turns out that this itself is a hard problem, and uh, for large graphs, you'll have to come up with ways of approximating even this, right? So I will kind of motivate why that is a hard problem in a minute. And the second problem that we are interested in is, what is the first problem? Exactly. So what could be the second problem? Given the margin of no. no. <laughs> find the model. I mean, how do you derive the model, right? But well, you are close, right? So how do you find the model, right? From the raw data. I right, will give you training data, I will give you a lot of data, how do you find the model? Right. So, so the Bayesian network structure learning itself is a hard thing. Right. So the simple problem is, so even in the, the structure learning, they split it into two things. Right. So I should probably put this down. The first problem is inference. So here there are two components to it. So given the graph, right? So I'll give you the graph. Find the parameters. And in the directed case, that would be finding the conditional probability distribution. So once I give you the graph, I know exactly what are the conditional probability distributions I need. I can just go to the data, count, and find it out, right? And in the indirect case, what it would be? Find the potentials. So given the graph, find the potentials, right? As soon as I give you the graph. You know what are the potentials that you need to estimate, right? So you'll have all these edge potentials, you'll have node potentials, and you have clique potentials. So you'll know what are the potentials that you are estimating, right? So and you just go and uh, estimate the potentials, right? So this is essentially the uh, learning problem. Given right? the second problem would be find the graph. So what are the things you should look at uh, finding in, in, in uh, trying to find a graph? Essentially, you would need to find that graph structure right, that supports the in conditional independence that is present in the data, right, whether it is directed graphs or undirected graphs, whatever graph structure you are learning. So you have to infer what are the conditional independence that is present, present in the data and you have to find a graph that will support that. Right. So essentially, you have to, uh, there are many ways of doing it. People start off with a completely connected graph. And then they start knocking off edges, right? And then you can do some kind of cost complexity pruning like you do in decision trees, right? So you could have a, a much more complex graph, right? Then you can try to prune things down so that you can do a trade off between the number of edges you have. So, so there are a variety of algorithms that people have proposed for uh, graph structure learning. So, this part is easy, right? Given graph, find parameters is easy. How will you do that? Well, it's just like conditional probability distribution estimates, right? So you can very easily do that for directed graphs. It's just counting. You look at the data, see how many times uh, uh, Mary called when uh, when there was an earthquake, right? Or or when the alarm rang, how many times Mary called, and then you can essentially fill in this conditional probability tables, right? So those things you can do uh, straightforward. But, but learning the graph structure is a little bit involved. I'm not going to get into that because it's it's a lot of uh, um, um, you know, a lot of structure that we have to build in before you can. So I'm going to now go back to inference. So inference is the interesting part, right? So let me start off with an example. Right? So I'm taking this example from right. So for a long time we didn't have a really good book on uh, uh, graphical models. And then Kohler and Friedman uh, wrote this uh, overcomplete book on graphical models. I mean, it's like 
it has everything that you would need to know about graphical models and more right so it's like this this huge tome right but it's it's, it's a fantastic book it's it really is a good place to start right so why i'm saying it's a good place to start is this is still a very active area of research right probabilistic graphical models and every year newer uh, techniques uh, newer breakthroughs keep coming up so it's uh, like it's not like you can write a book and say okay everything you need about graphical models is captured in the book right so because it's uh, it's it's a still evolving field right i'm going to draw a really large graph here Here's a sim uh, small uh, thing which uh, uh, Daphne Kohler came up with uh, to capture some fraction of her interaction with students, right? So, depending on the difficulty level and the intelligence of the student, okay, the student will get uh, some grade in her course, right? And the difficulty level of the course depends on how coherent the teacher is, right? So, the coherence influences the difficulty level, okay? And then the difficulty level and intelligence influence the grade, right? and uh, so depending on whether the student got a good grade or not in the course the teacher might give him or her a letter a right, letter of recommendation if the grade is bad then the probability of getting a letter is very small if the grade is good the probability of getting a letter is very high right even there that happens and whether you get a letter of recommendation from the teacher or not right it influences whether you get a job and whether you get a job and whatever grade you did influences whether you are happy or not right this is like right, so sometimes you might be very happy for having done very well in the course even if, even though you don't find a job <laughs> right so maybe maybe that's also possible right i'm just giving you the structure here because this is sufficient uh, for us to uh, 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 talk about some of the difficulties in the inference process right when you are actually solving problems in this you would need the probabilities but uh, we are not going there right so this is just to give you the structure suppose i'm interested in answering a uh, okay let let me write this out now probability c d i g s l okay so that's Can people see what I have written? If you can't, you can write it from the graph directly. So you don't, you don't really need need me to write this out, right? So, right. So this is the probability of coherence times the probability of difficulty given coherence times the probability of intelligence times the probability of grade given intelligence and difficulty, so on so forth. I just written out the joint distribution. Right? You can just look at the graph, and you can write out that yourself easily, right? Now I want to ask the question. 
let, let, I, I need more space, so I am going to do this here. What is the probability that a student in this universe will get a job? In this universe, I mean, the universe captured by that, right? So, what is the probability that person will get a job? Right? So, what will you, how will you go about doing this? Essentially, this will be. that guy. Right. So, if you think about it, this is essentially order of 2 power 7 computation if everything is Boolean, right. So, it looks odd, right. I mean, so, I mean, running this over the entire table, running this summation over the entire table is not correct. So, the whole idea of us doing inference was, I mean doing this factorization was to make this computation simpler, right. So, if I did not have the factorization, right, I essentially would have had to do this computation. So, yeah, so this is 7 sums that are running over this very large, uh, very large table, correct. So, now what we are going to try and do is try to make the summation simpler by pushing in some of the sums, right, pushing it in to the maximum extent possible, so that what I sum over okay, is as small a table as possible, right. Right now, I am all my 7 sums are running over the entire joint distribution, right. I want to rearrange this in such a fashion that each sum runs over as small a setup as possible, right. So, how will I do that? Just for the same question here. Do this that way, or something here. So, what do I need there? I will I'll just come to that in a minute. Continuing that. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, I moved from the conditional distribution to the uh, the potential uh, formulation, right. But you know what this means, this is essentially the conditional distribution here. So, you can actually think of that having been represented as an undirected graph also. We can use the same technique that I am do, doing here even with undirected graphs, right. So, that is the point I am to make that point, I just switched over from the this notation to this notation. So, in this particular case, these factors happen to be conditional distributions, but they could be 
factors that you get from your so in which case you probably have to have some kind of uh, normalization going here right so if you if you are going to use this as an undirected model then you'll have to have some normalization to take care of uh, the thing so is it correct so what i have written is correct right so the notation i'm doing here is essentially this right takes in j l s as arguments okay and returns a distribution over j okay, that is what the j here stands for so it takes j l s as arguments and returns a distribution over j right or some function over j this takes l and g as arguments okay and returns something over l so that is what this is right so this is essentially probability of j given l comma a so something like that the equivalent to that in my potential notation so that is the that is the thing i am marking here okay is it clear so now you can think about it right? so the c runs over only those two tables right? they are small tables so c has just one in, two entries in it right right psi c will have only two entries in it right whether the teacher is coherent or the teacher is not coherent right and uh, psi d comma c will have how many entries in it four entries in it right uh, how many independent entries in it okay it'll only two independent entries not three right because given the course is not given the teacher is not coherent what is the probability it is difficult so automatically one minus that gives me the probability it is not difficult right given the teacher is not coherent what is the probability it is difficult and one minus that gives me the probability that it is not difficult right so i only have two parameters so you can see that i am reducing the parameters tremendously so here what would i have had i would have had 2 power 8 minus 1 parameters right a full joint distribution right if i specify 2 power 8 minus 1 parameters and 1 minus the sum of that will give me the last one but here look i have tremendously cut down so this has one parameter this has only two parameters right so likewise this is going to have four parameters right for every combination of id you are going to have one one possible outcome for g the other one is one minus that right? so for every combination of id you need to have one parameter so you'll have four parameters so likewise here you will have one parameter again here you'll have two parameters so like that so you have reduced and if you take the product is much much smaller than the 2 power 8 minus 1 that we had right so that is the power of doing the factorization so the number of parameters you need for specifying the joint distribution comes down significantly and you can do this as well Right, you can start pushing the sums in, so that this sum runs over only a small number of elements. Right, likewise, this sum runs over a small number of elements, and so on and so forth. And then I can complete the entire joint distribution. Right, so this kind of an approach, right, where you push the sums in, is known as is known as variable elimination right so for small graphical models okay this is a good way to do inference right it's not an approximate way of doing inference it's an exact way of doing inference right it gives you the same result as you would have gotten if you had summed over the entire distribution okay so it's called variable elimination and uh, so the advantage is like i said the amount of computation that you're doing you will be minimizing right so how much computation would you be doing what will be the maximum what will be the largest table that you are summing over huh possible that i mean you end up summing over all the variables anyway exactly so it depends on how much you are able to compress the things and how much you are actually able to eliminate the variables so the more variables are suppose you are able to eliminate the faster will be your uh, computation right so think about what you are doing here the first step is marginalizing over c right so i'm going to say that you marginalize over c right and end up with a you marginalize over c and you end up with a, a factor over d right so i'm going to call it some tau 1 d right so what will tau 1 d look like
yeah, that is tau 1 d right. Next what do I do? What am I marginalizing over? Marginalizing over d right. So, this guy right. This whole thing I am marginalizing over right. I am going to call that factor tau 2 and what will it be a function of? g and i and that will be equal to So, I keep doing this right next time eliminating I so what will I end up with a factor over huh? G and S right yeah. Then what will I end up with? I love this guy as it is, right? I am eliminating H, right? So there is no H here. So tau 3 G S will continue propagating beyond this point, right? But I will also introduce a new factor called tau 4, which will have. Right, so you can see that, right? At this point, I am just trying to uh, trying uh, for you to get an appreciation of what the computation is happening. Right? At this point, you will have tau three, you will also have tau four. Right? So when you compute it till tau three, you have eliminated, you eliminated tau one, you eliminated tau two because you have rolled up everything into tau three. But when you do tau four, you are not able to eliminate that, right? So tau three is still carries on to the next level. Now we eliminate g. So what do you get at tau five? So eliminate G, so you'll have J left, right? You'll have S left, and L will now get added here. Finally, you'll get, depending on what order you do this thing in, Here I will I first sum over S, I get this, then I sum over L, I get my P of J. Right? This is essentially the or how you will be doing the elimination. So, as and when you are doing the elimination and you are creating these new factors, so what you should be thinking of is it is as if you are adding a new potential, it is as if you are changing the changing the graph. So when I did this, right? Well, I didn't necessarily really add anything new. D is already there, right? What about this? So now I create an edge between G and I. Uh, not a big deal. G and I already existed, right? But what about this? Now I create a potential between G and S, right? So when I come to this point, so it is like I'm adding a another connection between G and S, right? So likewise, anything else is happening? Anything else? J and L is already there, J S L, J S L. Right, I need to have a clique. For me to have a potential JSL, I need to have a clique. So I'm essentially like I'm adding a edge between S and L. Right. So you can think of the way we are doing this is essentially like we are making this larger and some of these potentials we are making larger and larger. Right. So in this case, it turns out that luckily none of the intermediate steps that we are creating 
makes a large table right nothing is larger than any of the existing tables right so we could choose a bad elimination ordering i can choose a different order so here the order we chose was c d i h g s l okay so that's order in which we eliminated the variables started off with the right end right c d i h g l okay suppose i did this Yeah, start off by eliminating g right so i can sum over g and i have to put in all the factors that have g in it right so what are the factors that have g in it i'll sum over g i'll do i'll write from this side right so i'll have psi l l comma g psi h h g j I have summed over G over all these factors. So now I am going to create my new tau one, right? So I'll call it tau one prime. So tau one prime will be a function of everything in that that is not eliminated, right? So G has been eliminated. So what it will be? So L, H, J, I, D. Ouch! Now I created a five-way table there by choosing to eliminate G first. Right, I have created a five-way table. So that's that's a large table. Right? Now I am going to sum over this. So, so I'll now I'll be summing over a table which has two power five entries. Right. So that's a bad thing. Right. So next one, what I have eliminated next? Try to eliminate i next. So what I'll do that. So I'll have tau prime of L H J I D. So any other factor that has i, psi i, this. So I'll be doing. And what what will this do? It'll eliminate i, right? But it'll add s to the factor. Right? So my tau two prime will be a function of l h j d s. Now I have another five factor table. Right? In fact, this is the worst possible elimination order. Okay, to give you the uh, to give you the the, the really bad picture right that is the worst possible elimination order then I eliminate s yes. so what do I do in that case well I add j l s also to the mix right uh, I will add j l s also to the mix I eliminate s yes, right but j and l are already there in the factor so in fact this will come down so my tau 3 will have only l h j d because I eliminated s yes, right then I will eliminate l right nothing new gets added the only thing that is left out is c right yeah so by the time i come to c yeah so everything else will get eliminated so finally i'll be left with a factor that contains only d and j and then finally I eliminate d so what will happen when i eliminate s yes. so we have we have done till s yes. okay what happens when i eliminate l i'll end up with a factor that has h j d s yes. then what happens if i eliminate h i'll end up with a factor that has J D J D what L right? No, L is already gone. I eliminate H, I will just end up with a factor that has J and D. I will have a factor that has J D, I will also have the, the, the C's, the last two factors will still be there, the psi C and psi C D C, the, those two factors will still be there, right? Everything else will get eliminated. And then what I eliminate C, that means those everything, all those factors will get eliminated, I will be left with the factor that has only d and g and finally eliminate d okay but what i have done along the way is that i have created a big clique here with five variables in it right so if you noticed as we went along so even though this looks like a clique of four variables okay it was never created as a clique of four variables right that at best i only did a clique of three variables just two different clicks of three variables it looks like a click of four variables but we never generated the click right but in this case we actually generate a click of five variables so it can become very very large right so it turns out that the 
uh, the complexity can be related to this the complexity of running inference on this graph can be related to the size of the largest clique you generate along the way right. So, so these kinds of edges that we generate like this right are called are called fill in edges yeah. Where? This one. G and S. Greater. G and S, this one, yeah. So, in the process, we are also eliminating I, right? So, should not we be removing those two edges connected to I? Uh, yeah, when you add this thing, I mean, so, well, I did not want to erase everything, but when you add this fill in edge, that is essentially when you have removed that. So, this is not really a click. So, this is not really a click. This is only a, uh, this, the, the edge is the maximal click in this case. So your question is, I, I don't have a potential that says I, G, I, and S, right? So when we did the original ordering, we never did a G, I, S potential. That is because what you pointed out. So I was eliminated, and therefore uh, we only have uh, G, I, S was already existing, right? We had a potential corresponding to G, I, S in the beginning. No? Why should we have one corresponding to GIS? No, we do not need one corresponding to GIS. No, no, we do not need one corresponding to GIS. Yeah, so, you do not need one at all in the inference also. When this fill in edge is added, that those things are not there, right. So, we only have to worry about those fill in edges which actually leave you with a clique. Yeah, that is what I am writing. Size of the largest clique in the elimination ordering. is called the induced width of that ordering. 